pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another book review of this novel, The Sea Change of Angela Lewis by Cynthia Popper Sutton, a 1971 novel. Was out of print, I think, for a long time, and recently been brought back into print, I believe, reprinted by Amazon. I absolutely loved it in a five-star way, despite it not being a perfect novel. But before I get into the novel, let me tell you a little bit of family history. As I read this novel, I thought about my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, who was born in 1896 and died in 1997. Grandma Mooney was 101 when she died. And when she was a teenager, before World War I, her dream was to be a doctor. And there she was growing up in rinky-dink Saskatchewan before World War I. And she wanted to be a doctor. Her best friend, Alice Mooney, did become a doctor. Saskatchewan's first female doctor. My grandmother ended up marrying Alice Mo Dr. Alice Mooney's younger brother, my grandfather. My grandmother's eldest daughter, my Aunt Marjorie, became a doctor, a psychiatrist, actually. And my mother was also a farmer's wife. So uh, my grandmother was a farmer's wife for 70 years. And my mother became a farmer's wife when she got married at age 18, and then the second year after I graduated high school, my, during my second year of university, my mother entered university and started a second career as a middle-aged woman. These family stories, and I think each fam all of your families will have some version of these stories, but these were really uh, lighting up, firing up like fireworks in the background for me as I read this wonderful novel, The Sea Change of Angela Lewis. This novel opens in 1939, July 4th weekend, on Long Island. The family gathers. Angela Lewis is 17. I think she might have just gotten engaged, but she's just graduating high school. And the grandfather had died a few months before, but the family congregates at the old farm in East Mauritius on Long Island. The grandma is very self-effacing. She looks much older than her 65 years and kind of fades into the background with all the her children and grandchildren around. Her daughter Caroline is much loathed within the extended family. The only people that really love her are her children, not her husband. Angela's parents are quite unusual. Her mother is quite prickly and her mother really hates Caroline, and you begin, you come to care about these people and this, this wonderful family dynamic, this colorful family dynamic, almost from page one. It's, it's sorcery how Cynthia Popper Seton sets all this in play and in, makes you invest in it from the opening chapter. I think it's maybe the second chapter where Grandma, who's usually referred to as Mrs. Porter, up and disappears. She does leave a letter, but it's a very mysterious letter, and she just walks out of her family's lives. And that's the primary story, but Cynthia Proper sentence submerges that story and keeps frustrating. <laughs> I want what happened to the grandma? Every chapter or every second chapter she gives you a little snippet, but not enough. And so you keep reading, keep reading, but it's revealed in small little narrative fragments throughout the rest of the novel. As we see the remaining women, there's men in this story, but they're kind of besides the point. But some powerful women in this story, as they move through the ensuing decades, in through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the very beginning of the 1970s, as they deal with being a wife, being a mother, wanting to have a separate identity, separate from those roles, 
creating a career, finding a creative outlet, a creative voice, and the lives of so many loved ones in my family reverberated against this story in a way that made it a really personal read, and I'm starting to get all verklempt again. I cared about the people in this story so much, and Angela Lewis, I guess she's the main character, although you could argue the, the grandma who disappeared is the main character. She finds a room of her own, and finds her own creative output. It's very, it's in some ways it's a it's a novel of its time, 1971, so there's a lot of emphasis on sexual liberation, adultery, that might put some readers off. Didn't really me, but it's read very in that way. It really read like a novel of its time. There's a few uh, passing references to homosexuality, and abortion becomes a pretty important issue at the end of the novel. Fascinating, but what made me love this novel was the f the deeply drawn characters and the family dynamics and the yearnings of these women for a selfhood and a way of expressing themselves separate from their roles as mother and wife. Let me read a passage, an example of, of the writing, because I, th I think the writing is quite lovely. This is a passage where Angela is on the lip of her new creative life. She's a middle-aged mum and she started some creative stuff. I'm not going to tell you too much about that. But she's in a hotel room by herself and the next day is going to be a momentous day for her new creative life. And here she is in the bathroom. So much mirror, so much sight of herself from which she couldn't flee in that fine bathroom brought her to a dead stop before her reflection. She stared in deadly earnest. I'm not fooling, she said out loud. She wore a deep orange cotton dress, but it looked pink in the surgical light. It was marvelous, she thought, the way this scientific light brought out the lines in your face, and lots of blotches, only some of which she'd previously known she had. A great graceless mass of unlovely gray hair sent her into a trance. She let it loose and brushed it and tied it up again. Frankly, she asked the mirror mirror, do I look like a woman who's had four children? Frankly, closer to eight. I think most women can relate to that. As a man, a gay man, I can certainly relate to that, how standing in front of the mirror can just fill you with self-doubt. And so there's something so powerful about that line. I'm not fooling. She's on the lip of a new life. And the fact that I was so viscerally invested in her journey that I almost cried when I heard her shout that in the mirror is a testament to what Cynthia Proper Seton has achieved here. I thought it was a beautiful novel. Not a perfect novel. Cynthia Proper Seton's prose has been compared, and I think rightfully so, to Jane Austen, George Eliot, Proust, and it mostly works beautifully, but she does sometimes get a little, what's the, the written version of tongue-tied, <laughs> with some over, overly elaborate sentence constructions that just were unnecessarily abstruse, but those kinds of sentences are few and far between. I also thought the novel did suffer somewhat from really heady, overly intellectual, Freudian come Socratic dialogues between the characters. The, what they were discussing was fascinating and on point for women talking about their lives in 1965 or 1970. But I don't think people really talked like that outside of movies and novels. and it, it was a little bit too much. None of that, none of those qualms knocked even a smidgen of a star, even the point of a f that fifth star off for me. This was a five exuberant five-star read for me, and I hope that you will check it out, because I got so carried away talking about my family story that I didn't mention at the beginning of this review. I discovered Cynthia Proper Seton in... Christopher Fowler's book, 
the Book of Forgotten Authors, and he raved about how wonderful her writing was and how nobody reads her anymore and she never got the audience she deserved. She was born in 1926 in New York City and died in 1982, very young, with leukemia. And six novels published. This is the first one I've read of hers. It's not her debut. It's a buddy read with Ange of Beyond the Pages. We are going to probably buddy read all the rest of her novels. And I think there's room for improvement, but I can't improve on the five-star love I have for this novel, and I'm hoping to, that this review will propel it into your hands. That's all. Thanks for watching. Oh.